welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. This is Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast, and my librarian co-host is Evelyn Hershkowitz from the Reader Services Department. And with us today, we have a very special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Jenny Fields, the author of Atomic Love. That is so great. I love that title. Thank I you. I think that is like the best, catchiest title. So <laughs> why don't you tell all of our listeners what Atomic Love is about? Atomic Love is about a woman who was a physicist on the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II. And the Manhattan Project is where they created the atomic bomb. Um, and she worked on the part where uh, they created the first atomic reaction, which happened in Chicago. So it's now 1950. And uh, time has passed. Uh, when the bomb was dropped, she was devastated, brokenhearted, because she, you know, a lot of scientists did not believe that the bomb would drop at all. They believed it was a deterrent. It was a bargaining chip. In fact, a lot of scientists sent a petition to Harry S. Truman begging him not to drop the bomb, but it never got to him because his secretary of state didn't believe in it. So it just didn't reach him. Uh, so she's brokenhearted after the bomb is dropped. She's almost had a nervous breakdown. And her colleague, who is also her lover, betrays her. And she loses her job in the lab. It's now 1950. And she's selling jewelry at an antique jewelry counter at Marshall Fields department store. And her old lover, who betrayed her, is trying to get back in touch with her and the FBI approach her and ask him, ask her to go ahead and see him because they think he's selling atomic secrets to the Russians. That is what a wonderful premise. Thank you. It's a great premise, absolutely wonderful. And, and the dramatic thunder, if you can hear in the background. I did, I did hear. <laughs> that was perfect. Yeah. In, in, in general, you know, to be a woman in science now um, is still difficult. And that's how many years after your story and uh, for your, for Roz, you know, aside, aside from the brokenheartedness over what her work did, her relationship, and then the fact that, and, you know, I don't want to paint that being um, in the service community, you know, in like Marshall Fields is shameful, but for her, she worked really hard for a career in science when it was even harder for women to do it. And now everything is up in smoke for lack of a better phrase. Uh, I know that you based Roz on a real physicist. Is it Lorna Woods who worked on the Manhattan Project? It's Leona Woods. Yes. Leona Woods. Oh my yes. gosh. Leona. Yes. Yeah. And Leona Woods was a young woman who, who did work in creating the first atomic reaction, was involved throughout the Manhattan Project on various things. Um, but I did not base it directly on her life. Uh, Leona Woods believed the bomb should be dropped, for one thing. Um, I've read many of her memoirs, but it, it did allow me to create Rosalind because it let me know that a, a young woman could have been there. There was only one woman, and she was the youngest member of the project. Leona Woods was an incredible person and extremely bright. Um, so I, you know, it did allow me to write about her. And I wanted to write about a woman scientist because my mother was a scientist. Oh, and, great. and you know, she was, wow. a bio, she was a biochemist in Chicago at the University of Chicago after the war. And, wow. you know, it's so amazing that I'm talking to you today because just yesterday something came up. She had always told me that she worked on a very important cancer paper and her name was on the paper in it. You know, you know, you kind of wonder if your parents' stories are apocryphal, but in fact, a friend of mine did a little research and found the cancer paper and said, this was an incredibly important paper that was used from 1948 well into the 1960s, and it has her name on it. There's only three people's names on it, and they called her Dr. Bell Springer, and she wasn't a doctor. She was, you know, she was just a, a biochemist, but anyway, she, just like a lot of women, she had to give up 
her career after the war. People were expected when they married to give up their career, give it to men. We don't want women here. And a lot of women lost their purchase on what was important to them or feeling important in the world. Um, their careers were just gone. And I wanted to write about that. Um, so in Rosalind's case, it's a little more complicated than that. But, but yes, I wanted to write about, you said women in science even now. It's hard to find women in science. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a book that I read a while ago um, about the 50s. I think it's David Halversham. I I believe is the name of the the author. But there is a lot of talk in that just about how you know that you had Rosie the Riveter, and they had this big PR campaign. Go help help our men build things. Do this. Go to work. And then as soon as that ended. Now your job is go home and have babies. Exactly. You can have, you can have cool kitchen gadgets. You can live in Levittown, which is where I live. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, go home, be a happy homemaker. Just forget about all that stuff we just said. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write about this era, because, you know, a lot of people have written about World War II, but after the war, there were a lot of incredibly scarred people. You know, the men had come back, uh, with, as my character did, with PTSD, Charlie, the you know, FBI agent has terrible PTSD from being in a prisoner of war camp in Japan. And the women lost their jobs and their sense of themselves. They also had, prep, you know, deprivation during the war. And so it was a lot of people who were told to be happy. Now you can be happy. Now you can have a family. But they were bearing a lot of unhappiness, a lot of secrets. And, um, and, and that's really what I wanted to write about. For me, atomic love is about uh, people with broken wings coming together to heal each other. Wow, that's beautiful. I like that. I just want to say you got a lot of people blurbing about this book. And one of the, I think, best-selling authors, Delia Owens, said she raves that atomic love is a riveting, a highly charged love story that reveals a dangerous energy at the heart of every real connection. Beautiful. Delia, yeah, that. that's wonderful. Um, yeah, and you had Ann Patchett. I mean, the list goes on and on how many people read it and raved about the book. So how did you go about doing the research? Well, I, I started learning about the atomic bomb. I needed to know how it was made. And I read a book called The Making of the Atomic Bomb and a bunch of other books about the atomic bomb. I read about spies in... Um, you know, in Chicago during that period. And there were spies in Chicago who were selling atomic secrets. And, uh, you know, and then one of the most interesting things I did was I read oral histories of men who had been in the prisoner of war camps in Japan. And uh, for me, that's one of the most vivid parts of the book is, is Charlie's flashbacks to his time in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, th they were just riveting and so um, they were painful and raw and true and vivid. And, you know, when you can read or oral histories, it's always the best way to learn about something because you're hearing what people remember and what they remember are the most vivid parts. So that was just incredible. I also read a lot of newspapers and magazines of the era. You know, it's just amazing to read women's magazines of of a particular era because you see the clothing and the recipes and the attitudes and you know right. sometimes the advertising is just as informative as the articles because it's like make your man happy with right. this delicious oh, right. food. advertising before you became a, an author Yes. You were in advertising, right? So for 32 years I was in advertising. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. You know, and there's there's one advertisement and I forget what it was for, but it was like it depicted a man like spanking his wife for not uh, cleaning or something like that. I, yeah. I, I yeah. forget the exact thing, but I it think was just it, I horrific. think it was I believe it was for making terrible coffee. Oh, <laughs> it was for making terrible coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, horrifying, you know, and that was the attitude is men are in charge, women are there to be a gentle to help them out, and to have babies. Right. And you, you can only imagine how extremely intelligent women felt about that. My mother who had to give up her career, 
just mourned that career the rest of her life. And, you know, she always did everything as a scientist. You know, she didn't just clean the house. She created the chemicals to clean the house. You know, she didn't just cook. She measured everything just like a scientist would. And she put her science into homemaking, but it was heartbreaking. And she always said to me, never leave your career. Always make sure that you have a career that you can fall back on. Did she go back to work after the children were older? She didn't. And it, you know, it wasn't a time when that was even done. I mean, she did volunteer at the local hospital doing uh, blood work at the lab. And she uh -huh. did that. But she didn't get paid for it. Right. I want to talk a little bit about Roz's relationship with the FBI agent. Right. Um, how did you, yeah, how did you, um, how did you kind of craft that? I mean, she's coming out of something, a distrustful relationship, um, and she sort of builds a new relationship with somebody who might not 100% trust her. Right. Um, both of them are very, are very scarred people. You know, he not only has PTSD, he had a, a very bad end to his last relationship. She, you know, had this horrible thing happen with Weaver and she is distrustful. And, uh, but you know, there's something so vulnerable about Charlie that she's drawn to him and he's drawn to her immediately. And I, like I said, I see them as two birds with broken wings. And, you know, I think that sometimes people like that are drawn together because they, they feel safe with each other. They know what hurt means and they can help heal each other. And that's really what I wanted to write about. Okay, the book that you wrote before this one, that was based on a real person. Yes. That was based on Edith Wharton, correct? And it's yes. called the Age, the Age of Desire. Do you like writing about real people or do you enjoy making up your characters? That's a great question. And the answer is, I loved writing about Edith because she was my, is and will forever be my favorite author. I really adore Edith Wharton. Um, but it was very hard to write about her in a way because she left lots of diaries and she wrote love letters to her lover. I wrote about her love affair at the age of 45 with a younger man. It was her sexual awakening at this late age. And um, it was fun to write about and it was wonderful to set it during that period. But there were things that happened like she became like a 16 year old. She was 45 and she just kind of lost it when she fell in love with this man. It was rather painful to write about that because, you know, people would say, well, she would never have done that. But in fact, she did. And I felt it was necessary to be true to her character. So when I wrote this book, I wanted to write about people who could have existed, but I wanted to create their own arcs and I didn't want to have to be you know, tied to what really happened. Because when you write about a real person, you have a responsibility to tell the truth about their lives. You're telling somebody about their lives. You can't just make it up. So um, this time I didn't have to worry about that and I could tell my own stories. I enjoyed it more. <laughs> oh, okay, good. And your other three, the other novels, they were all suspense? Books? No, they're, they're not suspense. Um, okay. they're, they're contemporary fiction. Um, Oh, well, actually, the first one is set uh, from 1960 to 1969, the era of, the, it begins when John F. Kennedy is elected to the time that Bobby Kennedy dies, and it's about oh, wow. the life of an artist, and um, how, while the arc of the world went from being very buttoned up and, you know, twin sweater sets, um, to being wild and crazy and flower children, her life kind of went backwards. So she was pretty wild as a pretty wild artist in 1960. And by the time the book ends, she's married and she's caught in a world that she doesn't want to quite be in. Um, so that's what that book is about. And the other books are um, about contemporary uh, relationships. Okay, great. So what was your favorite scene in this novel, in Atomic that's Love? My favorite scene was uh, the scene where Charlie walks home a very drunken uh, Stash Majewski um, and, and finds his wife at the door. And the wife is Charlie's old lover whom he loved all through the war and who has rejected him. And uh, she asks him in and 
they have to they speak to each other he's terrified to see her and he doesn't think he can handle it but actually it's a very healing thing to have her talk to him and i just loved writing that scene i even like reading that scene still um I thought that was a very tender scene and I thought it was very important for Charlie to be able to resolve his past in order to move on. Okay. Is your book out on audio book? It is. And the woman who read it, I hear is really good and I haven't heard it yet. Audio books are a passion of ours. We love them. And oh. we've spoken during this time, we've spoken to quite a few audio book narrators. So we've learned a lot about that whole process. So that's been good. If you want, I can look up her name. Do you want me uh, to look it that's up? That's okay. Jessica's, I think Jessica's looking it up right now. I'm yeah. watching, I'm she's watching well, her mind work. <laughs> she's, she's very well known. And okay. um, she's done a lot of important audiobooks. And she was my first choice. Is it Cassandra oh, Campbell? Cassandra Campbell. Cassandra oh, yes. Campbell. She's yes. yes. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and listen to the sample. Uh, and I like to... I like, if I read a book, I like to also hear the narration also. Sometimes yeah. I do both at the same time. So Somebody so told, told me that she was doing it very emotionally and very slowly and perfectly. Oh. And I can't. Well, then you got to gotta listen. You got to get yourself a copy. Come I on, do. The author. They should send it to you. I know. You're right. <laughs> so how have you been surviving during this whole pandemic? What has your life been like? Well, I feel very lucky that I'm not doing what I did uh, years ago where I was a creative director in advertising and a single mom and writing at one in the morning because I don't think I could juggle all of that right, right now during this pandemic. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just been so hard on parents and it's terrible. But for me right now, my life is not much changed. You know, I, uh, I live in a neighborhood where I can walk a lot. And so I try to walk, you know, three to five miles every day, no matter oh, what. Good for you. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have to be anywhere. I'm writing full time now. So uh, it hasn't changed my life. I feel almost guilty about it. To we get you. that a lot from authors. <laughs> <laughs> Those who are like, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is know, our life it's anyway. Like, it, it, it's pretty much what I do. I stay home and I write, but my family is going crazy is yeah. what, we, what we've been hearing and, and driving me crazy. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, librarians and our lives have completely changed. I'm sure. I can't Public even libraries. imagine. You must, you must miss going to the library, don't you? Or no, we're there. Oh, you we've, are? We've You're been in there the for months already, yes. Behind really? plexiglass, though, everybody's masked, uh, and we are not, you know, the summer is a very busy time in the library, and we are not, because we're not, uh, we're not doing any in-house programming. Everything is virtual. online. Right, right. A ton of interviews. Yeah. Well, you good. know, the good, the, the silver lining about it is that more people can join your yes. podcasts and, mm -hmm. you know, do think see things online. I did an event with Ann Patchett last night and already a hundred people watched live and already a thousand people have, have accessed it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so are there any other time periods you would like to write about? Well, I'm working on a new book, um, and part of it is set during the civil rights era in Nashville with the lunch counter sit-ins, and, um, and that's something I'm researching now, and I found somebody to talk to who was there, and I'm very excited to speak to her and hear what she has to tell me. That's great to get it straight from the person. That's, that's wonderful. It's even yeah. better than the written word, right? Exactly. It's much better to be able to ask questions. Actually, when I wrote Atomic Love, I spoke to an FBI agent who was in the Chicago office in 1950. And oh, wow. it was amazing speaking to him. He was in his late 90s. He has subsequently died, but I was able to ask him all my questions. And he was thrilled to have someone ask him these questions. It was just great. How long does it usually take you to write a book? It takes me usually about five years. Wow. I rewrote this book 10 times. I, I've never rewritten a book quite this much. Uh, but, you know, I really love this book. I wanted it to be as perfect as it could be. So it takes me a long time. So I have a Nashville-related question. 
are you a fan of the music scene down there? And do you have a few favorite uh, places to experience it? Well, m my husband is a musician and, <laughs> and, and he, he writes and, and sings. And my stepson is uh, the drummer of the Cadillac Three. And I don't know if you know them, but they're world renowned. And um, so, you know, I, uh, the best place to hear music is at the Ryman Auditorium, uh, which is a, a famous and incredible music hall. And, you know, my stepson's band has done a, you know, a headlining show there. That was a lot of fun to be backstage for that. Um, and, you know, there are little music places to hear music, but everything is shut down right now. So <laughs> when, it re when it reopens, I think one of the things that um, when we were down in PLA, it was so overwhelming because there were so many honky tonks and yeah. some of them had three different bands on different floors and you were just sort of overwhelmed. Well, you know what? I mean, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Most of the people who live here don't go to the, to Broadway at I all. I was going to say it seems it <laughs> seems like the it seems like the tourist place it, it is. to go. It, it is, and uh, you know we usually go to listening rooms or you know quiet little places nobody knows about to hear music like the basement or something like that that only people who live here go to because the honky tonks are crazy and filled with drunken bridesmaids and we don't know oh, them. them yeah they were they were there i mean during pla they were also filled with drunken librarians <laughs> you know <laughs> not that librarians uh, that's a complete that's a complete fallacy L library <laughs> conferences are nuts uh, there was like a commercial a few years back about something being as exciting as a library conference and everyone was shushing themselves <laughs> and my husband was like have these people even like ever been to a library <laughs> conference? It's crazy. So yeah, so we were we were the librarians walking around the honky tonks. Like I don't even know what to do next. Well, did you get on a pedal bar? That's what most tourists do. No, like, we what? did not. No, I'm glad you didn't. Actually. What is that? I don't know what a pedal bar is. So it's a place where you climb up into a seat, uh, which is on at like a bar stool, only it's got pedals. And oh. you and you run the pedals, and everybody sits at their seat, and the little machine runs down the street. It's very crazy. <laughs> oh, never heard of that. I have not been to Nashville. I would love to get there one day, but I have not made it. Maybe if it opens up again and PLA is there, I'll have the opportunity to go. Right. Have you been to any of the librarian conferences? Have you been to BEA or any? No, no. I, I, I never have gone to one of those conferences. I've certainly gone to a lot of literary conferences, okay. but never mm -hmm. to a library conference. Yeah. Well, you should either. go. I mean, you know, yeah. there are people there maybe, who are, we're not all crazy. <laughs> maybe when, you, when Maybe when your next book comes out, it'll coincide with one of the conferences and you can come and do a I, signing. And I would yeah. love that, actually. I, we love those conferences. Those are like my favorite things. It's the best. Maybe. Yeah, maybe when my paperback comes out, and if I get to go on a book tour or something, they'll send me to a conference. Let's right, right. I mean, it's like gold. You you go there, you meet authors, you get ARCs. They sign your AR, authors right. sign your ARCs. It's like the best. You take a picture with them, which we love. <laughs> all of all of our <laughs> listeners who are not librarians are now exceedingly jealous of how great library conferences are. They're going to be like, <laughs> oh my god, they party and they get books and they get the they get to hang out with authors <laughs> yeah it really does sound like fun doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. really a great time so the book you're working on now is there a deadline or you just no i okay. i'm i don't ever take a deadline i would rather not take the money first and just keep writing um because i don't want i want the book to be right before it comes mm -hmm. out and i'm not in a hurry so i do i do it as per my need to, to finish it. And then I, then I sell it. Okay. That's good. What, what makes you comfortable. That's great. Hey, whenever that is, we hope you'll come back and, and talk to us about it. Thank you. I would love to. Absolutely. Did you write while you were still working in advertising? Were you doing both at the same time? I think you did mention that. 
Yes, I published my first book when my daughter was six years old and I was a single mom and working in a very intense uh, job as a creative director at a big New York agency. And, you know, somehow I managed it. I, I couldn't do it now. I can tell you, you that. You lived up here in New York City? Is I lived you... in New York, yes. And um, so really my first three books were all published while I was uh, working full time. Wow. And when I sold the fourth book, um, I had met my, my husband was my college sweetheart. We got back together after 25 years and we oh. commuted for 10 years between New York and Nashville. Wow. Six, six of those years we were married. Oh. And so, um, after I sold my, uh, after I sold uh, Age of Desire, I said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm, I've made enough money, I'm gonna quit advertising and move to Nashville. And it was really a wonderful thing because there's such a great writing community here. People don't mm -hmm. realize how many amazing writers there are and, you know, and, you know, that are my friends now and are very special and very, um, you know, they 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 really opened my mind to new ideas so i feel very fortunate to be here. did you always want to be an author is that something you were always doing from the time i was six years old oh. actually that's I like me. i wanted to be a librarian so really did you mm -hmm. well, see i can relate to that because i loved libraries when i was a kid right but i read this book called twig uh by a woman i think her name was elizabeth Orton Jones. And it was a book about a little girl who lived in a tenement and she found this tin can that was cut up the side and she puts it in her backyard hoping that an elf will move into the house. And of course an elf does move into the house. I was so <laughs> intrigued by this. I sat down and completely imitated it and wrote my own version of it. <laughs> Your first fan fiction. Well, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly well, what it was. <laughs> uh, we want to thank you so much for talking to us. And thank again, you, you have an open invitation for coming back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So once again, this was Jessica and my co-host, my librarian co-host was Evelyn. And our guest today was Jenny Fields. And we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.